Everybody give it up for Kathy Pearl. All right, so let's talk about conversation design um, and what it is. Uh, first of all, how many people here have heard of material design? So uh, that is Google's design philosophy, um, taking into account the physical world, so having layers of things like that. How many people here have heard of motion design? Still, fair number of people. Um, and how many people have heard of conversation design? All right, pretty good show of hands. Well, what is conversation design? I get this question a lot, and as head of conversation design outreach, I should hopefully have an answer. Um, but one way to think about conversation design is that it's how we can create experiences that enable computers to communicate like humans do, and not make humans learn a weird computer-like language. And it can take different forms. A lot of times people think of conversation design only as voice UIs, but in fact, that's just one type. Uh, you might speak to something like a Google Home, which is a, a voice-only experience. Um, you might be using your mobile phone, and that can be a conversation in a variety of modes, right? You could speak, you could type, you could tap, you could swipe. All these things are still part of that back and forth that you might be having with the computer. And of course, we just saw, you know, it can be in the car, it can be on your smartwatch, it can be a lot of different places, your fridge. Um, and all these are considered conversational design, conversation experiences. Um, but the thing about conversation design especially, and I know all designers have this, this kind of issue where everyone's a designer, you know, they say, this would be perfect if they just had a different color green or things like that. And we get the same thing with conversation design, which is, you know, I can have a conversation, I can write, prompts and, and the way that the, the computer could speak. Why do I need to have some specialist do this for me? And part of the reason is because language is complicated. Um, think about something that seems like a very simple question. Do you want coffee? Let's say somebody asked me this. And I said, coffee will keep me awake. Now, show of hands, how many people think this is, no, I don't want coffee? How many people think this is, yes, I would like some coffee? All right, well, the answer, of course, is it depends. Um, if you ask me this in the morning and I've got a big deadline, um, it's probably a yes. If you ask me at bedtime, I'm probably telling you no. So this is the kind of thing that we do on a daily basis all the time without even thinking about it. And it's very easy for us as humans to interpret these kind of things. But it is very hard for computers. Um, think of another example. If I ask you, can I get a ride tomorrow morning? Now, we were talking, Chris was talking earlier about the, in the car, um, that pause of four and a half seconds. Well, turns between humans are super fast, blink of an eye fast, 200 milliseconds in general between when I speak and you speak. If it's longer than that, like let's say more than a second goes by after I ask you this question, I know something's probably up. You probably don't want to give me a ride or can't give me a ride, but you don't really want to tell me that. <laughs> So it's a good indication. So in that case, I will probably take another turn. It's really your turn because I just asked you a question, but I'm going to take another turn because you've given me a signal, a nonverbal signal, because pauses are part of language. And I'll probably say something like, oh, you're probably too busy. How about Friday? So there's a lot of information in there. But again, it's very hard for computers to do this kind of thing. We are using body language, eye gaze, tone, all these things that most of our computer systems do not yet have. OK, so another thing um, I wanted to mention specifically about conversation design and how it might differ from some design, uh, other design disciplines. Um, sometimes if you're doing something like website design, we often start with the structure. We might think about um, how everything is going to be laid out. We might be uh, creating templates, things like that, and maybe not fill in all the words, all the content until the end. We might just fill it up with a bunch of Latin, right? But that is not the way we do it in conversation design, because in conversation, the conversation itself is the structure. People come to uh, my team and they say, well, I built this thing. Um, it's, it's pretty much done, but could you just take a quick look at the words and make sure they're okay? And we usually have to say, well, <laughs> you know, that's not really what we do. We think about it from the very beginning. What is going to be the flow? What, could, what are the things that people can ask or can't ask? And how do we communicate that to the user? And a lot of that has to take place in design in the beginning. It's not sort of an add-on at the end. Um, a good example 
I think that illustrates this point and, and why it can be complex to, to design these things. Um, this is an example I got from my colleague, Jared Strauderman. He was working on business hours. Fairly straightforward feature, right? You want to ask what time is a business open, and you want to get an answer. Now, let's say I do this on my mobile phone with my Google Assistant, and I say, what time is my local sushi restaurant open? What time is Sushi Ku open? It delivers a card, basically, right? A list of days and times. And the cognitive load is on me. I can get the answer to all my questions by perusing this information and deciding, is it open for lunch? Is it open on Tuesdays? It's all right there. This is not the way you want to go about it with a voice-only situation if I ask my Google Home. The audio channel is much more limited than the visual channel. If I'm looking at my phone, I can take my time, I can stop and scroll and, and really take as much time as I want. If someone's talking to you or you're listening to some audio, you can't rewind or fast forward or pause. You have a limited amount of attention that you can spend on that audio signal coming in. So you wouldn't, for example, just rattle off all this information. And some of the ways that, we, that um, people often get into trouble is they might have an API call that they've used in the past to get their visual information. And then they're like, this will be easy. I'm just going to read it all out loud. And then we fall down because it's not a good experience for the user. It's hard for them to comprehend. So when he was working on this, he was thinking about the fact that there's a lot of different ways that we might ask a very similar question about what time a business is open. A lot of different ways you can phrase it. And the way a human would respond if you ask them the question is they would respond to some of these subtle differences in the way these questions are phrased. So for example, if I ask, what time is Sushi Ku open? That's a slightly, slightly different phrasing than, is Sushi Ku open? Is Sushi Ku open is a yes, no question. And the system should respond accordingly. It should say yes or no. Like, look at this one. No, it, no, but it'll be open in one hour at 11. That's a very natural way to respond to that question. And it's a little bit different than just telling the hours. And the reason we do this is not because we are trying to pretend we are human. We are not trying to fool people and say, you know, oh, you're really speaking to a person. That's not the reason. It's to leverage these ways that we talk to each other because it's easier on us, less cognitive load. We don't have to be wondering what exactly do they mean. It's just a nicer way to communicate. We might as well take advantage of that. So again, the point is, some of these things, uh, when you're thinking about especially a voice-only situation, take a lot more time to design and iterate on and think about. And you have to do this up front, because this is going to affect your code. You can't, at the end, decide that you need all these different. Um, he decided he needed 66 different structures to answer this question about if a business is open. And you've got to know that early on, because it's going to affect your software development. OK, so let's talk about some specifics. How are we going to do a good job on this stuff? The very first thing we always say to start in a conversation design situation is to start with sample dialogues. Now, and before I get into that, obviously, before you've done this, you've done some user research. You've decided that, in fact, a conversational system is the right approach for the problem you're trying to solve. You've, just, you've realized that there is a problem you're trying to solve. It's not just something you think is cool, or your friends think is cool, or we got to do voice, so let's figure something out. You're solving an actual problem, et cetera, et cetera. So. That's been established. You're ready to design. A sample dialogue is essentially like a movie script. It's a sample path, a snapshot in time between the user and the system. And I'm going to show you some examples. But basically, what we say is, in the beginning, you write a bunch of these sample dialogues. And some of them are going to be blue sky paths where everything goes great. But you're also going to spend time on when things go wrong. Because in speech systems and natural language systems, so whether you're speaking or typing, it will go wrong. <laughs> Um, if you think about the difference between uh, you know, a more traditional GUI, when somebody taps a button or picks a menu item, you know what they did. You know what they tapped or selected. Maybe they picked the wrong one, but you know what they did. With speech recognition and natural language understanding, it's a little bit more of an educated guess. We usually know mostly what they want, but we often get it wrong, which is the same when you're speaking to a human. You don't get every single word that someone says to you, for the most part. Um, and so, you know, our computer systems are going to be similar in that way. So let's look at an example. This is um, a made up, uh, what we call an action on Google. An action is basically a way for a third party to um, add an experience using the Google Assistant. So I made one up called Cool Animal Facts. So the user invoked it by saying, OK, Google, talk to Cool Animal Facts. And it comes back, welcome, 
what animal do you want to know about? Penguins. Do you want to know about their habitat, what they like to eat? What do they like to eat? Give some facts. I'm done, thanks, the end. So I want to point out a few specific things that this sample dialogue illustrates. And again, keep in mind that a sample dialogue is one possible pathway. I'm not showing all the different branches, all the different animals, et cetera, et cetera. This is one path. And a lot of people want to try and cram everything into to, you know, to one sample dialogue, but you want to focus on one thing at a time. OK, a few things to notice here. First of all, you got to let the user know a little bit about what you do. So it's an animal facts thing. It tells that. And then it asks a very specific question. Notice it didn't say, how can I help you, or what's up, or you know, some cute thing. It gave a very direct question. Which animal, or what animal? So the person says penguins. Next, you'll notice something called an implicit confirmation. It said, cool, penguins. So again, speech, we get it wrong a lot. It's good to know that they got it right. So you know, OK, it knows I'm talking about penguins. And then the call to action is very specific. You can get two things here, their habitat or what they like to eat. Um, and then the next one, again, after it gave you some interesting facts, there's another call to action. Again, it doesn't just kind of, a lot of times I'll be testing various actions or skills, and I'll see that it just kind of ends and waits, and waits for the person to say something. But how the heck do you know what you can say? Because as the point was made earlier, these are constrained systems, and they can't understand everything someone's going to ask for, so you have to be more direct. And then finally, just to note that people want to have a graceful way to exit. They want to be able to say goodbye a lot of the time. Uh, we found this when we were designing phone systems. Some people would just hang up after they were done, but most people wanted to say goodbye, and they wanted the system to say goodbye. That's just built into us as politeness. And you need to think about that with your conversational systems as well. All right, let's look at another sample dialogue that's much, much shorter. This is what we call maybe a one-shot or a one-turn conversation. Now, you might say, that's not a conversation. That's one turn. You know, if, if I went up to you and said, how are you today? And you said, fine, and then you walked away. Is that a conversation? Not a very satisfying one. Um, and we could argue the semantics of that. But I th the more important part to me is the fact that whether or not this is a true conversation, we don't have to agree or disagree. Nonetheless, it still fo must follow the best practices of conversation. So in this case, this is demonstrated by the response. So this is one I use all the time. Um, I was going to travel the other day, and I'm sitting to breakfast, and I'm like, hey, Google, is my flight on time? It comes back and says, yes, your flight's on time, leaving at 1 PM. Now you look at this, and you think, sure, that's a prompt, big deal. But a lot of thinking had to go into this. What if it had said instead, so I said, is my flight on time? You could well imagine a world in which it said, Flight American Airlines 1234 is departing SFO 1 p.m., landing in Newark at 9 p.m. That would be a very annoying thing to hear. It's too much information. It's not what a person would say. I already know I'm leaving for SFO. I always leave from SFO. I'm leaving that day. It's not a surprise. I don't need to know the airline name. I don't need to know the flight number. Also, again, I asked a yes, no question. It started by answering yes. That is the most salient piece of information here. Yes, your flight is on time. When it is not on time, which I don't like to hear, but sometimes I do, it says, no, your flight's not on time. It's leaving at 3 o'clock or whatever. Again, I want to know the most important part up front. OK, one more sample dialogue example. Um, this is another made up one about a zombie quiz. So it's going to ask me my first question. What should you do if you're being chased by zombies? This is a lot of information. So maybe I'm, I'm thinking, I don't know. I don't know that much about zombies. I'm not sure what I'm going to do. So again, back to timeouts. If the user doesn't say anything, you need to come in and help them. For voice-only systems where you're not having a visual screen, like in the car, you might want to be, look, you might be looking and looking up again, um, the default timeout for this is usually about one and a half seconds. Remember earlier I talked about that one second thing with, with human conversation. So in about one and a half seconds, we'll pop back in. But don't just pop back in, and I see this all the time, and say, I did not understand. What do you want? Or something like that. I don't know. I don't remember. Remember, I can't rewind. I can't look at my options again. So we say them again. Which one of these? Then I'm, again, I'm musing. I'm not sure. I pause again. So we do something called escalated, escalated error prompts, meaning don't just repeat the same thing, because I didn't get it last time. I need a little more help. Maybe I'll give them another way to respond. Which one do you like, one, two, or three? And then the person can say it, and they're done. Um, again, spend time on your error handling. 
Interestingly, if you do this really well, people might not even realize they're in an error state. When we have conversations with others, we often get off track or don't understand. But I don't say something like, oh, I was talking to so-and-so and we had four errors in our conversation. We, we don't think of them as errors because we're so skillful at getting things back on track. And if you design your conversations well, it can be a similar thing where people are like, we just moved along in the conversation, we clarified maybe, but um, you need to just think about what's going on in their mental model, why are they struggling. People are generally trying to cooperate with your system. I mean, there are people who kind of play around with it, but generally speaking, they want to get something done. They're not like purposely being, you know, difficult or something. So go with that they're, and help them out so they're not stuck. All right, so um, I'm gonna talk about some, just a few general principles and then my final bit will be about some future speculation. So this is just sort of a, a list of, of things to keep in mind whenever you're designing one of these. My biggest thing I always tell people is design for how people actually talk, not how you want them to talk. People can say the simplest thing in 50 different ways. I mean, everyone's got their story, their narrative. Even if I'm ordering pizza, I got my way of ordering pizza, and it might not be the same as yours. You know, I might call the pizza place and say, hi, I want to order a pizza. What will the humans say? Great. How many? What size? Or I might call up and just give the whole order. Hi, I want to order three large pepperoni pizzas to go. Your system has to handle all these different things. Um, and so even if you think, oh, I've got a simple thing like pizza ordering, it's still going to um, have a lot of variety in the way people ask for things. Uh, another thing I often see is people get very excited about this voice or conversational system they're building, and they're like, we can do 20 different things. It's going to be so awesome. But again, you have this problem. How the heck do they know what those 20 things are? Don't just list them out in a menu, like maybe um, a bad IVR you may have heard uh, do before. Um, pick the top things that people are most going to want to use and make it very, very clear. What you could do, maybe you have five things that they could do, and you tell them the top two. And then you do something called just in time, which is later on. You might be like, oh, also, by the way, you can do such and such. So don't try and do everything at once. It'd be very hard for your user to know what those are. Um, I often hear we're in this new age of AI, and we can do how can I help you because machine learning. Um, but what we call directed dialogue, where we ask a specific question, is not necessarily a bad thing. If you think about the way we converse as, as people, we are not constantly jumping from topic to topic. We're not just randomly asking questions in the middle of a conversation. We usually stick to a particular topic, and even sometimes when we want to switch, we might be like on another topic, or I was thinking about this other thing, and we give some kind of indication, hey, I'm going to change topics now, we're going to talk about something else. And it's really important to, to not just get swept up in this idea that, oh, it's all solved now, and we can just be like, how can I help you, or tell me what you want, and it'll all work great. There's a time and a place for the open-ended type of question, and a lot of times a more directed instruction is totally fine. Um, another thing is to think about when you want to ask a user an extra question and when you don't. And there's a lot of different philosophies about this, but my personal philosophy is, Sometimes you do. So an example, I want to uh, play the song Hello. Do I want the one by Adele or the one by Lionel Richie? Well, maybe you're a really smart computer, but you don't actually know. You don't know. You don't know me. You don't know me. Um, so you should ask a follow-up question. I've got one by Lionel Richie and one by Adele. Which one do you want? Let's say I pick the Lionel Richie one three days in a row. Well, hey, then be smart. Do some learning. Play that one next time. Um, think about weather. Uh, I live in Belmont. If I say, what's the weather in Belmont? Don't ask me, do I want the one in California or Canada, like weather.com, thank you. Um, you. It knows where I live. Just play Belmont, California. If I ask for the weather in Springfield, I don't live near Springfield. There's one in every state. That's probably a good time to ask a follow-up question. Another one I talk a lot about is, so we humans, we like to be acknowledged. If I go home, oh, it says I only have two minutes left, but I don't think I've, yeah. anyway. Um, if I'm complaining about my bad day, I don't always want you to solve my problem, right? But I want you to acknowledge. Similar with these systems, if uh, I want to rent a car and you can't do that, you might say, sorry, I can't rent a car, but I could book a hotel room for you. Don't just say, I don't understand. And finally, we already talked about this, but always end your, the computer's turn with a clear call to action. 
Um, one tip about multimodal systems. Um, we're moving into the world where we have a lot of these uh, screens. Where we, and something like this, this is uh, our Lenovo tab tablet that we released this summer. This is what we call a voice forward device. It's not the same as a tablet. It's not the same as a phone. You're not always looking at the screen. What we always say is start with sample dialogues, even if you're doing uh, visuals. Visuals are an enhancement um, that will go with your, start with the most constrained situation, which is the voice only and then think about where the visuals are gonna enhance the, the thing. Um, so I guess I'm not gonna be able to get through all the rest of the slides if I only have <laughs> one minute. I thought I had a half an hour total. Oh, okay, phew, I was like, I really think I have more time. Um, okay, so a few things about the future. This is purely my own speculation. This is not like a Google roadmap or anything like that. Um, but just some things I'm thinking about. So. Here's a picture of the Simple Human Smart Can, only $250. And for that, <laughs> you get the option to say, open can at any time, and it will woo, open, and you can throw something in. Um, there was a really uh, funny uh, comic in the Wall Street Journal that had a kitchen, imagined kitchen of the future, where every single thing in the whole kitchen had a name. So the dog bowl had a name, and the dishwasher had a name, and different names. And so you'd have to, to know the name for each thing and, and ask for it. Um, but luckily, I hope, that will not be the future we live in. But maybe we will have a future in which no matter where you are, whatever room you're in, whether you're not at home, whether you're outside, that you'll be able to speak to something and it will respond. How do we feel about that? How do we feel about everything listening to us all the time? Um, most of us, I think, have some mixed emotions. I certainly live in a bubble. I work at Google in Silicon Valley, and I've been working on this technology for a long time, so I'm pretty, pretty comfortable with it. I'm okay with my 10-year-old son having one of these devices in his room. But I recognize that not everyone is at that same comfort level. A lot of people are comfortable having a mobile phone in their pocket all the time, which is always listening but not necessarily a smart speaker. Um, but you know what, perception is more important than reality. If people aren't comfortable with it, that's something that's just true. It doesn't matter, we're not gonna try to prove to people that you know it's okay. Uh, so what should we be doing about this? Well, one thing we should be doing is being very transparent about what we do with our data and treating our data in a, in a, in a mindful, ethical way. Um, for example, with the Google Home. Um, as most of you probably know, when it's listening all the time for you to say the hot word of, hey Google or okay Google, it's doing that locally. That information is never sent to the internet. And as soon as it thinks it hears you say, hey Google, it does start streaming that to the cloud. Now, you can look at your, the app on your phone and you can see every time it thinks it heard, hey Google. It doesn't always get it right. You might be saying nothing to do with it and it thinks you said, hey Google, and it turns on. So you can look at that and you can listen to the audio that it recorded and you can delete the audio. So that's one way to be a little more transparent so you can always know when it, when it heard you. Um, in addition, you know, Google doesn't keep that audio, it anonymizes the audio so it can't be associated with you, things like that. But again, we need to be transparent about what we're doing with this data and how we're handling it. This is a picture I took at the San Jose airport uh, of the robot babysitters. They don't babysit robots, they are supposed to babysit kids. Um, but, and there's always a human from the company in the, this ball pit with the, with the robots. And I find that the kids in there are usually paying more attention to the humans than the, the ro robots themselves. Um, but it makes me think about this idea that we will probably be growing up with these virtual assistants. So you'll have them probably from a young age, and it'll be very personalized because it will get to know you and your preferences, and your virtual assistant will be different than someone else's. Um, and what do we think about that? Well, I think there's good and bad there. I think it's nice to have a companion that knows you well. You could vent to it. It's a safe space. I think those are some nice things. Um, on the other hand, anyone who reads Sherry Turkle may have read some of her um, discomfort with this kind of thing. She was talking about watching an older woman um, tell a very sad story about her son dying to a robot, and Sherry Turkle was just horrified. Like, how can you tell something so emotional to something that has no capacity for emotions itself? 
Um, and, and I definitely see the concern there as well as we might get so used and comfortable with our virtual assistants that we might just completely avoid other people and conflicts. It's like, oh, I have a conflict with my best friend. I'm going to tell my virtual assistant to tell her virtual assistant that I'm upset, you know, and, and maybe I'm just going to stay home and, and not talk to anybody. So, you know, there's some, some pluses and minuses there. Um, and my, f let's see, final slide is a video from MIT Media Lab. It's about a minute and a half. This is a product, a prototype of something called Alter Ego. And you wear it on your face. And it uses bone conduction to understand what you're saying. Um, some of the headlines for this have horrible clickbaity headlines like, it reads your mind. It does not read your mind. What it does is it allows you to speak. Oh, something's mad about that. Um, it allows you to speak without making sounds. So you're doing what's called subvocalization when you're sort of forming the words, uh, but you're not doing it out loud. This is going to be really important because for a couple of reasons. One, of course, is privacy. If I'm like on BART, I don't want to be talking about, say, my health issues or other things um, and hear, having other people hear me. But also, it's just about the practicality. If you're in a shared office space and you're all talking to your computers all day, that's going to be super annoying for everyone else to hear. So there's multiple reasons why something like that product, um, it's not a product yet, but something like that technology will be really important. Um, OK, so what if you want to know more about this, how to do a conversation design? I will point you to Google's site, actions.google.com slash design. And I have some cards that have that URL on there. But basically, it's got lots and lots of best practices about best way to do this, um, how to do sample dialogues, all those other things. And then finally, of course, I'll <laughs> make a plug for my book, uh, Designing Voice User Interfaces, which also goes into a lot more detail about these topics. That's it.